morning and welcome to Morning Movie News, where today we have three surprisingly vibrant news stories to discuss. But isn't Hollywood supposed to be winding down for the holidays or obsessed with Star Wars and releasing trailers to play in front of Star Wars? Well, they are doing that. But of course, Hollywood has to keep on churning out movies and as they get ready for other films for the summer, to release them, to make them. Uh, we have been blessed with a bounty of good uh, movie news stories. And the first one is Pixar setting up Coco for next year. Very little is known about this film, so we're seeing Pixar begin to lay the groundwork. Uh, and they did so through Entertainment Weekly, giving them an exclusive as to the actual story. Uh, it didn't really land. Some, you know, a number of you did tweet me about it, but I didn't really see it get picked up across the spectrum, uh, so to speak, and perhaps it would have been better received if it had been made as an announcement directly from Pixar itself. So, nice try, Pixar marketing team, but that didn't quite work out. Uh, but it should have, because well, maybe, you know, maybe Coco is just not going to be a big, big performer. It made my wild card list for 2017, along with Cars 3, risky year for Pixar. But what concerns me about Coco is that when you... When you target a specific demographic, in this case the Latino demographic, I know it talks about Dia de los Muertos, which is primarily a Mexican holiday, but still I think it's meant to appeal to the Span Spanish, um, not just the Spanish language audience, obviously all the whole Latino audience, but sometimes the specific audience doesn't show up. You know, women didn't particularly show up for Ghostbusters. Uh, sometimes, you know, quote unquote black film like Queen of Conway didn't see the African American audience show up. So. It's not always if you make it, they will come, you know, to quote Field of Dreams. So you really need to have a broader appeal. You know, we, we talk about the importance of the four quadrant appeal, particularly for a blockbuster or an animated movie from the likes of Pixar, no less, Pixar Disney. So I, I worry about the limited appeal of this. And The Book of Life, uh, an, another animated film from a couple of years ago produced by Guillermo del Toro, was so good and it was also about Dia de los Muertos but it simply did not connect. I mean I don't think you could make a better movie about Dia de los Muertos quite frankly but Pixar is gonna try. Uh, they're good at making you cry and we're, as you're about to hear the setup here it seems pretty solid for that uh, but I actually it doesn't you know I have to say one of the things I get upset about with Pixar and why I call them emotionally manipulative is I don't think they earn their, their big moments. But I have to say, the groundwork that I see being laid here is very impressive. I think they're doing the legwork, so those emotional moments are going to be more earned. Like their earlier films, even through WALL-E, uh, Up is where I felt it. You know, I think Up might have been before WALL-E, but anyway, I think Up was where they started to become super manipulative. But anyway, let's talk about Pixar's Coco. And I'm curious if you can see not only yourself going to see this movie next year, for Thanksgiving no less, uh, a very Amer it's weird to have, I mean, it's close to Dia de los Muertos, which I believe is in October, but, you know, to have a, a movie celebrating, I think it should come out for Halloween, quite frankly, but to have a movie, uh, we're going to talk about Halloween movies actually a little bit later on in this video, but to have a movie that celebrates another country's uh, holiday during, to be released during, a, you know, probably one of the most American holidays you can have, you know, it's actually just an American holiday. Nobody else celebrates Thanksgiving but us. Is well, well, maybe that's the answer. Maybe the international audience will have to do the heavy lifting on Coco. But anyway, okay, here's what it's about. So it's about a 12-year-old boy named Miguel who lives in a, a, a lively village in Mexico, and he wants to be a singer, a musician. But unfortunately, his family is totally against music. They're very hardworking shoemakers, a.k.a. cobblers. Use the right word, Pixar. They just said shoemakers in the Entertainment Weekly coverage. But anyway, the reason that this is the case, what the reason they're so against music, is that his great-great-grandfather left his great-great-grandmother to be a musician. That's pretty heavy stuff for a family movie, right? And so she had to dig in and become a really hard worker to take care of the family in his absence, his absence, and she started the shoe empire that they have today. I don't think they're I don't think they're supposed to be like an incredibly wealthy family, but they're supposed to be, you know, a very well-off family. Maybe like uh, uh, Don de la Vega from Zorro <laughs> and really nice Hacienda. Oh, if you'd ever watched the old uh, Disney Zorro TV show, it's pretty awesome. But anyway. Uh, his favorite singer is the late, as in passed away, Ernesto de la Cruz, who will be voiced by Benjamin Bratt. And, you know, he, he's Miguel's idol, and Miguel discovers a link between the two of them that allows him to enter the land of the dead. And not only does he go in search of Ernesto de la Cruz, but he also meets his own ancestors, including that great-great-grandmother. And on the way, he's accompanied by a trickster skeleton, because this is an animated movie, named Hector, who will be voiced by Gael Garcia Bernal. 
uh, which is interesting. They said in the article that it was difficult. They had a, they were a little worried about being able to cast him, but luckily he's so comedic and uh, Mozart in the Jungle, his Amazon series, uh, that they the Pixar was okay with it. You know, the higher ups like John Lasseter. But I have to say, Gael Garcia Bernal has had a lot of opportunity lately to step into the main spotlight. Uh, you know, with a couple of movies, and it hasn't worked. So he's not. He's not a draw. They would have been much better off getting uh, Eugenio Derbez in there. Uh, I love Eugenio Derbez. But he's not in the movie, and I hope we'll, we'll see how that plays out. Or Eugenio Derbez is like, he used to be the Adam Sandler of like Mexico, and now he's like the Kevin Hart. The, uh, their careers wane. Eugenio Derbez persists. He's a really talented guy, and if you haven't seen um, Instructions Not Included, uh, his Spanish language film that would, I think is the, still the highest grossing Spanish language film ever here in the United States, you should see it. It's very good. But anyway, he, uh, Miguel wants to earn his family's blessings to be a singer uh, as he travels through the land of the dead, which of course is what's celebrated in Dia de los Muertos. So I think this sounds actually really solid and really surprisingly mature and sophisticated for, again, an all-ages movie. So I'm actually very excited about it. And it's also worth noting that the voice of Miguel is uh, Anthony Gonzalez, who is the second, they've been working on this for so long that, you know, the actor's voice has changed. They needed another kid to come on and do the scratch voice for the tests. And they liked Anthony so much, they decided to keep him for the actual movie, and he does his own singing as well. So that's great. Very exciting. They did a great job casting uh, Moana's voice with Alihi Cravajo. Uh, also, um, the correct um, heritage, so I, I, I'm excited to see if Anthony Gonzalez is, is a strong a casting choice. Although, of course, different divisions of Disney, Pixar, and of course, Disney Animation. All right, so speaking of strong casting, let's go to the second story with Walton Goggins. I love Walton Goggins so much. This story made me so happy yesterday when it broke because it's so great to see really hardworking, quality actors take the next step and finally be rewarded for their efforts and their perseverance. So Walton Goggins is going to be the villain in Tomb Raider. Oh, it's so great. And of course, uh, Tomb Raider, Lara Croft, is now Alicia Vikander. Not too crazy about that, but I'll see this movie for Walton Goggins. Now, I believe he was on The Shield. He's been on Sons of Anarchy. But I know Walton Goggins through his work on Justified as Boyd Crowder, where he is amazing. Ah, he can just... The tapest the 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 the, uh, the audio tapestries, the linguistic tapestries that he's able to weave, are a thing of beauty. And in fact, some people had said, you know, you really seem like a fit with Quentin Tarantino's dialogue. And Tarantino heard this, and it was like, you know, I think you're right. So he Walton Goggins has started to become part of the Tarantino repertoire. Uh, repertory. So he was in uh, he had a very small role in Django Unchained, but he had a much bigger role in Hateful Eight, where he was fantastic. And I think that that has helped him considerably in the movie business. Uh, he's, of course, on Vice Principals on HBO. But now he's, this is like a major movie role. This is very exciting. I'm so happy for Walton Goggins. He was also in uh, American Ultra with uh, you know, the Max Landis movie with uh, Jesse Eisenberg and Kristen Stewart, which, where he was also very good. So uh, Walton Goggins has been working for a long time. And it's so great to see him finally take it to the next level in his career. He reminds me a little bit of J.K. Simmons, actually. Very hardworking you know, very long-working actors who've stuck around. It's hard to stick around Hollywood in the long term without being, like, having mega success. But they, you know, they, 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 pay, they, they pounded the pavement, they did the work, uh, they're working actors, and I'm so happy to see their, their talent recognized. So I'm so excited about this news, and the Tomb Raider movie now is super on my radar. I mean, it was on my radar because it's Tomb Raider, but now I'm excited about it. All right. So the third story of the day I'm not excited about. This is the news that Little Shop of Horrors is going to be remade by Warner Brothers and that Greg Berlanti is going to uh, be in charge of it. That's a disgusting story. All right, so let's, let's dial it back now. Little Shop of Horrors is a very famous musical. It is the one that put Alan Menken and Howard Ashman on the map. It's a remake of, like, um, I, forget, I forget the name of the filmmaker. I watched the behind the... I, I bought... Uh, recently purchased Little Shop of Horrors to watch it for Halloween this year. And I watched, uh, I watched the behind the scenes, you know, making of uh, documentary that they had on there. And they talked about the fact that it was like this uh, really fun, uh, you know, cult hit movie that was made, you know, very cheaply because, you know, the, the, I can't believe one of you down below will write the name of the. He's someone who churns out like a lot of these like lowbrow um, 
cult hit horror films. But anyway, he had the opportunity to shoot on a soundstage that was already set up, so he had to make up a movie that fit with the set. And he came up with Little Shop of Horrors. And Alan Menken and Howard Ashman turned it into a musical, which was very popular on Broadway, and that was made into a movie. Movie, not so popular. It was funny to watch the documentary because they were like, oh, this is going to be a big hit. It's going to enchant millions. And you were like, oh, I'm from the future, and it didn't. But it is a cult hit, and it's such a good movie. Such a good movie movie. But anyway, it got Alan Menken and Howard Ashman on Disney's radar. And they, of course, then went on to do The Little Mermaid, which has a lot of similarities to Little Shop of Horrors. And then they evolved themselves in terms of their talent for Beauty and the Beast and then Aladdin. And then Howard Ashman, of course, tragically passed away from AIDS. But it's a very important, very, very important movie, both in terms of the history of um, the musical on Broadway and also Hollywood itself and filmmaking. So I... I'm not totally against the idea of remaking it, especially because I think a lot of people aren't familiar with the movie, unfortunately so. It's, it stars Ellen Green, who originated the role uh, uh, on Broadway, and it's very rare, as they talked about in the documentary, for someone who originates the role to be in the movie. And she recently reprised the role yet again on Broadway with Jake Gyllenhaal instead of Rick Moranis as Seymour. And I like the idea of Jake Gyllenhaal as Seymour. I think that's a really good idea. And if he could be in the movie... I'd kind of be a little bit more excited about it. And I'd be excited if they had a really good director. But Greg Berlanti, I just don't see him working in the movie space. He's, he's very successful in the television space. He does the DC shows on the CW. He's also doing the upcoming Riverdale. I mean, the guy knows what he's doing when it comes to the small screen. I mean, the crossover they just had is like one of the most watched things on the CW ever. It was a huge hit. He did a great job. He engineered that. And I think Warner Brothers is clearly looking to reward him for his work. But... They have to remember his movie work. This for, and, he, and for Warner Brothers, no less. They've burned him before. Fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. And that's the situation we have here. Berlanti was a writer and a producer on Green Lantern, and he was a producer on Pan. Oh, he also uh, directed Life as We Know It, some like mediocre romantic comedy with Katherine Heigl and Josh uh, Duhamel. I think it just sounds absolutely horrible to have him involved with this, and especially, you know, this is really important material. I guess they were like, what do you want, Greg? We're so pleased with the results you're getting on the CW. What would you like to do? And he just is like, Little Shop of Horrors. And they're like, okay, without taking into account the, the legacy of the project, the importance of it, the fans, uh, you know, you can't just make something that's a treasured piece of Broadway and movie history into a lollipop for Greg Berlanti. Oh, I'm annoyed about it. But I, 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 again, I'm not a, I annoyed so much about the idea of revisiting it because that's the way musicals are. They revisited. And I like the idea of someone like Jake Gyllenhaal. Also, on a side note, did you see Family Guy recently where they did a, a funny game show? Is it Jake Gyllenhaal or Jared Leto? And they had some really funny jokes. I mean, I think it, it was done. It was, they, they even said, oh, you know, Stewie even said, oh, I love these guys. I'm turning off this show. But it was, it was pretty on the money. Uh, so Jake Gyllenhaal and a Little Shop of Horrors remake. I like it. Greg Berlanti anywhere near the project. I don't like it. Now let's move to the uh, the viewer question, which I thought was a pretty interesting perspective on representation in Hollywood. All right, so this is from uh, Abdevilliers22212, uh, in case there's another Abdevilliers out there. All right, so anyway, Abdevilliers says, Grace, I have a question for you. Why is straightwashing, i.e. casting straight actors in LGBT parts, I don't think that terminology really works because that would imply turning LGBT characters into straight characters. So basically what Abdelieres is talking about is having straight actors play LGBT roles. So why is this controversial? For instance, Benedict Cumberbatch playing suppose, who's supposed to be an Indian character in Star Trek had a lot of a ba had a strong backlash, but playing a gay man in imitation game won him accolades. Rudy Mara as Tiger Lily was disastrous, but her as a lesbian in Carol again won her accolades. Good job, Abdelvier, is coming up with specific examples of people, not just like you know the idea that the, the specific actor has done both things and in one area it was bad and one area it was good. I like, you know, good legal mind you've got there. So anyway, Abdul Vieira saying, continues saying, this is even more egregious in the case of cisgendered men playing transgender women like Eddie Redmayne in The Danish Girl. Why is whitewashing criticized while straightwashing is applauded? I wouldn't say applauded. I would say it's a more complicated situation. And I think that you have to look back to the root of it being the, there's, there's just the position of gay LGBT actors and, um, and cisgendered actors in Hollywood. It's very difficult for them right now, and a number of actors just simply aren't willing to be out, you know, out of the closet in Hollywood. Even someone like Luke Evans, 
who, and I, you know, I've, I've called Luke Evans to task for this because he was like, I don't know why so many people are in the closet. I'm out and proud, really implying that everybody else was, you know, you know, letting fear guide them and it was unnecessary. They were, they were in the closet for no reason. And then, of course, sure enough, Luke Evans kind of took, put one foot back in the closet. I mean, he, he sometimes he's photographed with his, uh, you know, his boyfriend. Uh, but for the most part, he's not nearly as vocal about it as he once was when he first came to Hollywood. So as you can see, it's difficult. Kevin Spacey's been inching out of the closet, but even still, he hasn't officially come out. There, you know, I think that there, you know, I think that there are comedians and uh, hosts that are able to come out of the closet, like Ellen DeGeneres, obviously, and, and do very well. But it's been very difficult for actors. Uh, I think Luke Evans actually is, you know, to his credit, Luke Evans is, I think, probably one of the most you know, success, successful uh, gay actors working today and his ability to play straight roles. I mean, he's freaking Gaston, right? The picture of mas heterosexual masculinity, and he's going to play that uh, role. So good for him. But, you know, it's other actors have struggled. Rupert Everett, of course, was like, oh, I'm an out gay actor and my best friend's wedding, and then his career just totally um, dissolved. So it's very difficult for actors just in themselves to be the gay actor or the LGBT actor who would be cast in these roles. Then also, if you can only cast LGBT actors in LGBT parts, does that mean that LGBT actors can't play straight characters, right? If you start creating that delineation, then it closes potentially closes a door, the, a much bigger door, right? Because there are much more straight roles uh, in, in entertainment. So I think that's something else. That's why I think you don't see LGBT, uh, you know, actors fighting for this. And that's the thing. When you're dealing with uh, skin color, you know, actors, you know, they can't change their skin color, right? I mean, either, you know, you are the skin color that you are, and so you need to fight for the roles that, 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 are, that, are, that are rightfully yours. But with LGBT, that is something, of course, that does not, it's something that an actor does not have to be confined to what they are in real life. They can, they can act, they can act, right? So that's, I think, why the situation is a lot more complicated. Uh, and also, there, uh, when you have a big movie like The Danish Girl, you also need name talent. Uh, the reason people get upset about whitewashing is because there, there is talent um, of different ethnicities that is a draw, that is well known. Uh, but really so far, I mean, look at Laverne Cox on uh, Rocky Horror. That did, she's a transgender actress, and th that did not do particularly well. Uh, I mean, of course, I'm not saying it's 100% her fault, but she wasn't able to bring in people, perhaps maybe if they had gotten a straight actor or a gay actor to, to star in that, in that adaptation. So it's, 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 a, it's a difficult situation. I think progress is being made. Uh, these characters do exist, and I think so often that is the first step, that the, that the roles exist in the first place, the LGBT roles exist, and then maybe that'll lead to, you know, I, I was going to say more opportunity for LGBT actors, but that shouldn't. LGBT actors should be up for any role because they're actors. All right, so I hope that explains the complicated situation to you a little bit uh, better, Abdul Vieres, but really interesting question. All right, everybody, that's today's morning movie news. Thank you for tuning in. Please write down below what you think today's top three stories, stories Abdul Vieres' question, anything you'd like to see covered tomorrow, and any questions that you might have. Thanks for watching. Bye.